Thank you, Ian, and thank you to the committee. And I must say, my time in Port Leisha has been quite an eye-opener. Uh, for those of you who weren't there last night, we had an extraordinary cultural event and an extraordinary community event because we had Port Leisha seizing on to an idea which was to celebrate a local dignitary who'd been more or less ignored for a very long time, like 160 years or whatever it was, um, and actually have a political conversation around him. And we had this extraordinary dramatic thing produced by... Uh, <coughs> where's Miles Duncan? Are you there? Yeah, Miles and his colleagues. We had James Finton Lawler coming to life in a series which I hope is going to be with us forever. Miles has started interviewing the dead... <laughs> he had interviewed Oliver Cromwell but it had been a bit stormy this was James Finton Lawler and next apparently is Brian Baru and he interviewed him and a very interesting interview it was I thought he gave him a slightly soft time but I'll get back to that in a minute but what was more impressive for me in a way was um, the children that the, the primary school Raheen Primary School, they'd thrown themselves into the whole thing of getting to know James Finton Lawler, getting the children involved, getting them to see the house he grew up in, uh, getting them to write pretend letters from him, from school, from jail, from all sorts of places. They were really, it, it was remarkable, and I give full marks first to the teachers who bothered to do that, and of course to the children. Uh, I live in England, and I have to say there's very little sense of history there. In a way, it's somehow terribly yesterday. They don't trouble themselves. They read a lot of books about it, but the schools don't interest themselves, and I was thrilled to see this happen here. <coughs> but the most interesting thing for me last night, although the dramatic performance was marvellous, was that among the speeches was the president of the GAA, Liam O'Neill. And Liam O'Neill said, this is all tremendous and all jolly good, but we must remember the other points of view. And he suggested that in future, we shouldn't just be representing the anti-landlord position. We should be thinking about actually considering the point of view of the other side. Uh, now, oddly enough, so I was trying to think of letters that children might think of writing for next year, because I hope that this summer school is going to last, and I think it will, judging by the enthusiasm of locals. Um, I think next year you should set the children the job of writing a letter from Queen Victoria, who is <coughs> very hurt that everybody says she gave £5 to the fam to famine relief, when in fact she gave £2,000 out of her own money, which in today's ter terms is £60,000, and she was also patron of a charity and she was very exercised about it. And somehow... With all our historians and all our educational establishments, we don't know that. So we're not asking the right questions. We're actually still peddling myths. So my suggestion is that real adulthood and all this is when we ask our heroes more hard questions. So next year, I think Miles should say, for instance, was the bottom of your antipathy to Daniel O'Connell to do with your Oedipus complex? <laughs> Was that also why you fell out with absolutely everyone? <coughs> what about the good landlords? You never mentioned them. What about the good landlords who ended up... Oh, sorry, he's making faces in the front row, so he's suggesting you did. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, what about the good landlords? You never talked about them, right? What about the fact that subdividing Irish land was a looming catastrophe anyway, and you couldn't just blame the landlords? What about your lack of interest in uh, landless labourers? And the urban poor, weren't you really, for all that you were falling out with your father constantly, really fixated on his class? Um, I just mentioned those as suggestions that you might <coughs> ask James Finton Lawler next year. Uh, then I would have said, not the question actually, come to think of it now, I might ask him myself if I'm ever asked to do so. How did you feel about being brought back to life, to public life, because you were used by people with an agenda? because Patrick Pierce had just discovered the notion of social justice, and he was looking around for somebody to underpin nationalism and social justice, and he lit on you. 
at the same time when James Connolly had decided you were kind of min, some kind of mini Marx, which is actually what Thomas P. O'Neill says in his biography of uh, Pinchon Lawler, that Connolly was trying to turn him into a mini Marx. <coughs> were you happy about this? The land question you said was the thing that mattered above everything. Well, actually, it was solved by the time these people prayed you in aid for a revolution which um, had nothing to do with land and which really brought about a circumstance when the strong farmers ruled. And I might ask you a bit more about the Celtic tiger and greed. Anyway, enough of James Finton Lawler. An interesting man and well done for honouring him. And I think the summer schools are the most wonderful manifestation of the <coughs> cultural enemy, uh, energy, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Enmity comes into it when it we get to the politics. Okay. We're talking about politics and the press. We have virtually no investigative journalists, is my contention. Now, my colleagues, some of whom know an awful lot about this, may differ. But the fact is we are completely and utterly trammeled by libel laws. <clears throat> it's bad in the United Kingdom. It's infinitely worse there. I am sick and tired since I took up journalism of people saying, why haven't you the got the courage to say X and Y? Because the lawyers take it out. I have had several libel actions taken against my newspapers about things I said that I would say were true, but either they paid people 10,000 quid just to go away and not bother them, which had lots more people coming along and threatening to sue again, or they lost incredibly expensive actions in the courts and juries of the people awarded extraordinary amounts because they think that libel damages grow on some little fairy lights place. Uh, they don't realise they come from newspapers and that ultimately they'll kill newspapers. These days, I'd like uh, some of my colleagues to talk about that, but these days it's worse and worse and worse. And in Northern Ireland, where things were going to loosen up a little bit, uh, because the UK had reformed its libel laws a bit, actually quite substantially. It is being blocked, the reforms are being blocked from coming to Northern Ireland by, um, I hesitate to say conspiracy or I'll get a libel writ on my desk tomorrow, but I would say a bit of a conspiracy between the DUP and a libel lawyer who has the ambition of making Belfast the libel capital of the world, which London used to be but Belfast now wants to be. Can I just say one thing about the UK and libel law? With all the fault failings of the UK, so far the press there, and the press have done lots of things that are wrong, but the press have had about eight MPs locked up, MPs and peers, <coughs> locked up for corruption, for fiddling their expenses, for all of that. They do have an investigative press. Without the investigative press in the UK, we wouldn't know about the grooming gangs in various towns and cities. I don't know if you've read about that here. The grooming gangs in which vulnerable teenagers have been groomed by mostly Pakistani grooming gangs. That was not being covered. It was not being taken up by the police. It was not being taken up by politicians. In the end, the journalists do it. We need an investigative press, however vulgar and intrusive it is. Otherwise, the politicians rule okay. Now, politicians hate the press. That's the thing we have to remember. Um, not everybody here may agree with me, but I'm going to ask Senator John Whelan to take up first the proposition that politicians hate the press. Thank you.